Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In this series, our next topic is culture and happiness. Do you think culture is very important when we are studying happiness? Yes, it is. Before that, we should know how we can study impact or association of culture with happiness. I think you know about psychological testing. And in last classes, I discussed about psychological testing. In psychological testing, we have series of questions or items and then we have force choice answers like strongly disagree to strongly agree. Say for example, a particular statement and then their response in terms of strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree and strongly agree and all the choices are denoted with numbers. So, in this case at very initial stage we convert person's behavior or participants behavior in numbers and there are least chance to study cultural impact in such kind of methodologies. On the other hand, if we have open ended questions or semi structured interviews in which we are asking some questions in which they are elaborating their responses. So, during this elaboration we get culture specific responses. So, that is the way of studying more impact of culture in terms of uh, happiness studies. For example, in this study they said what is happiness? So, when you are defining happiness then you are using certain words or certain terms or certain ways of defining happiness which you think are highly connected with your culture. And in such kind of studies we observed that culture has significant impact on happiness. For example, in this study when they compared Chinese students with US students, they observed that in this essay or the questions in which we are saying that how do you define happiness or what is happiness. Then they observed that Chinese students emphasized on spiritual cultivation and transcendence of the present. On the other hand, US students emphasized the enjoyment of present life. So, uh, we can easily compare culture wise specific different responses for happiness. Similarly, in another study they observed that western and eastern countries students predict different factors for happiness and they said west participants focused more on independence, autonomy and agency as predictors of happiness. On the other hand, eastern participants focused more on interconnectedness of self and closeness to others. I think you can easily connect when we are saying western cultures and eastern cultures, you can easily connect it with collectivistic versus individualistic culture. And in collectivistic cultures, we give more importance to others as compared to individualistic cultures. In individualistic cultures, we have eye oriented responses. On the other hand, mainly in eastern cultures or in collectivistic cultures, we have more we oriented responses. Culture orientation and well being, let us understand a little bit more about it. There are some studies saying that lower well being is found in collectivistic nations. However, uh, later on researcher identified that there may, may be some other reasons. One might falsely conclude that collectivism is problematic for well being and there may be role of culture. So, if we do not have conceptual equivalence of happiness or any other construct which we are studying, if we do not have this uh, equivalence in both the culture or in multicultures, if we are doing multicultural study, then we may get misguided results and we may uh, have some conclusions which may be uh, misguided. Take example of happiness and this happiness model is deficit model that favors the West. So, this particular model which we have selected for our study, it is more favors West. 
in this or western cultures. So, in this case the results of western cultures better than eastern cultures or collectivistic cultures it may be lack of conceptual equivalence. And that is why before doing such kind of researches like cross cultural researches or multicultural researches our first objective should be to have conceptual equivalence of the construct which we are using in that study. So, they are saying that sometime if this lack of conceptual equivalence may be cause of a problem or cause of having lower well being due to which we may have misguided results. So, without due consideration of the potential lack of conceptual equivalence we may make such mistakes in the interpretations. Therefore, careful consideration of cultural, linguistics, functional and metric equivalence is necessary in any cross cultural and multicultural researches and that is very important to understand such kind of phenomena for cross cultural psychologist. Let us understand this concept a little bit more that is cultural oriented responses we can get if we are taking into account culture. Various western scholars have given example of eastern students who gave some specific responses not like western students and they quoted that how culture can have important role in studying or in understanding happiness. In these example first example is of an Indian doctoral student. An Indian doctoral student saw the book cover of Myers 1993 book and it means we all want to be happy and the student remarked simply I do not. So, it means they may have another priority not happiness. Another example is a young uh, Singaporean man remarked in a conversation that he was going to marry his fiancee because it was socially expected of him not because he thought he would be happy in the marriage. So, it means social expectations are more important than to get happiness. Third example is given by Myers. Myers interacted with a Korean student who was very explicit about choosing a career to be rich not to be happy. So, that he could bring face to his parents by buying them a new costly car. So, in all these cases they are saying that happiness is not very important for them, but maybe social expectations. Even in my classes I have observed that along with happiness some students give importance to money. So, there could be various other factors rather only happiness which is top most rated phenomena. So, social expectations may be there money or some other factors also. So, when we say all other uh, factors may be along with happiness then it means culture is very important and sometime in different culture we get different results. Seen at all in 2018 explored responses of Korean and American students and they used a free association method. What three words come to your mind in association with happiness? They got 1563 words which were reported by 521 Korean and American students and they observed that for Korean participants family was top most important. On the other hand for Americans the smile was most frequent word. And in social words in terms of say relationship and social emotions family in Korea and friend in the USA was highly rated. Both Korean and Americans who mentioned more social words were significantly more satisfied with their lives. So, lessons from such kind of uh, researches are first we have uh, different responses in different cultures. On the other hand social uh, words and social emotions or interpersonal relations are highly rated in individualistic as well as in collectivistic cultures. Let us take one uh, local example from our research and with this example I would like to share with you how a particular group on the basis of age, gender, locality we may have quite unique responses. Let us understand this concept with our study which was conducted on older Indian rural women. In this study we collected data through psychological test which was quantitative as well as qualitative. In this data we asked the question taking all things together how happy would you say you are? Please mark a 10 on the scale if you are very happy and 0 if you are very unhappy. I think you can easily connect it with the previous you know messages. It is actually country ladder 
through this we study overall level of happiness. Along with this uh, quantitative data, we also elaborated this question and the uh, second part of this question was please give us the reason why you chose the response. So, in this case we could get unique responses and let us first understand what were their responses and then uh, we will talk about cultural aspects of this study. We divided all the responses in three categories, languishing or suffering if responses are 0 to 4 category, moderate and struggling if responses were in the series of 7, 5 to 7 and flourishing level 8 to 10. In these responses, we observed that 0 to 4 responses or suffering, it means what are the factors which are hampering their well-being. We observed that the factors were very unique and in most of the factors, they gave importance to family. For example, health issues faced either by themselves or a family member, death of spouse or male member or son or grandson was the cause of suffering poor financial economic household conditions were cause of suffering, lack of earning of family member unemployment was cause of suffering, daughter becoming a widow at an early age, alcohol consumption, habits of son or spouse was quoted by them, worried about one's own deteriorating health, inability to attend religious activities and uncertain future as cause of low level of well-being. On the other hand, for higher scores, uh, say 5 to 7, they experienced mixed feeling of happiness and sadness. And uh, however, more results were towards uh, positivity, but still the in between they had some uh, mishappenings in the family or some other reasons which made them sad. By this group members, happiness experienced was attributed to their family flourishing, since that their current circumstances are good being blessed by the Almighty, loving family and satisfied life, good health, responsible and obedient children they perceived they had, occasional attempts to find happiness in self, religious groups that made life meaningful, religious bonding that improved life and peace. However, some of them shared some past mishappenings in the family and that is why they were happy, but still they were struggling on you know higher level of happiness. So, similarly in the next one uh, 8 to 10 flourishing. So, through these responses we can understand which factors they have identified or they perceived as flourishing factors. Their responses were more positive and satisfactory such as children's uh, employment and financial stability. Children respect elders, they perceived that there was presence of a cordial relationship among family members as well as with neighbors, joyful family circumstances, settled family, good economic conditions, residing in joint family, sense of belongingness they had, faith in God and it helped them during facing problems. Some women were highly contented in this group. So, through this research we can understand that suppose we have study on adolescents, on adult, on say college students, do you think we would be having similar kind of responses? So, it means particular age is important where we had almost all responses which were family oriented. Second point here is if we uh, take data from male members, do you think we would be having similar kind of response? Third, if we just uh, change locality, say urban locality, I think definitely we would be having different kind of responses. So, that is why age, gender, locality and maybe you know collectivistic culture, these all factors are very, very important. And when we are doing such kind of studies, we should understand which group we are taking in our research and uh, that is why as per nature of this group, we may get such kind of responses. So, that is why especially when we are doing studies by using qualitative techniques, then we get some unique responses which are highlighted by a particular age, particular gender, particular locality as well as culture. So, culture is very important phenomena for us. Similarly, if we take another research conducted by our group and in this group we had 12 countries and 13 data sets. 
and again that was open ended question in which broadly we asked how would you define happiness. And we observed that because it is cross nation study. So, that is why we through this study we can identify role of uh, culture and how uh, different nations people or different cultures people responding differently. So, in this study we observed that when we give open ended question what do you mean by happiness. So, then uh, there are various definitions some definitions are psychological, but others are family oriented relations oriented health oriented etcetera. So, in this study we got total 7551 responses in this study as I mentioned 12 countries and 13 data sets we had. From India we had two data sets one is from North India and another was from South India. So, in this study we observed variety of responses and uh, psychological definitions 42.33 percent were in this category, family 15.79, relations 13.38, health 5.75, daily life 4.81. Uh, standard uh, 4.79, work oriented definitions were 4.57, spirituality religion oriented definitions were 2.87, leisure 2.87, community society oriented definitions 2.83 and education oriented 0.23. So, it means different people are defining happiness differently and there could be various classifications of all those definitions and uh, role of culture is very important in all these things. Then uh, specifically I have borrowed from this research paper what were psychological definitions and in psychological definitions we observed that harmony balance oriented uh, definitions were 29.13 and total responses were 3196. So, harmony uh, balance oriented definitions were 29.30, satisfaction 16.55 positive emotions oriented definitions were 13.92, positive states were uh, 7.13, optimism oriented definitions were 5.44 meaning 5.04, no negative feelings 5.04, awareness 4.69, autonomy 3.85, engagement growth 2.78, mastery 2.63. Uh, purpose 2.41 and self actualization 1.38. So, it means when we are saying psychological definition then different aspects of psychological definition have been addressed by different scholars. Let us compare different countries and especially our interest is in North India versus South India. So, then uh, the total data was divided on the basis of self integration versus self assertiveness oriented responses versus experience or metacognition. Metacognition means thinking about thinking or cognition about cognition. So, broadly we can say internal processes when we give more importance to internal processes rather on external processes. And we observed that South India definitions were more metacognitive or harmony which is within us or the you know within world to some extent we can say focused on. On the other hand North India focused more on positive states uh, which is uh, you know similar to Brazil and Portugal. On the other hand it is Italy, Hungary, Mexico, Argentina matching with these countries. So, I think easily we can understand uh, North India and South India also showing cultural differences on happiness. Then in the next one relations versus task focused definitions versus outer or inner focused definitions. And in this case again it has been observed that North India more family oriented definitions or we can say matching even here you can easily say with USA. On the other hand South India focused more on spiritually oriented definitions and uh, again inner focus on the other hand this side that is outer focus. So, I think the point which we have raised here culture is important factor for understanding happiness that is uh, true and it is uh, approved by certain researches. If you want to study this research paper in detail, so reference is here you can study even further aspects which we have raised in this study. So, that is very important for us because 
which type of processes and activities are valued and considered positive by a particular cultural group that is very important to understand because then only we can understand which factors are important here which have impact on well being and which factors are hampering our well being which factors are facilitating our well being researcher suggest a model for determining whether certain activities will provide the desired in increases in well being. Such kind of studies I will discuss in uh, next classes in which I will give some studies from rural India and how through specific or culture oriented activities we have observed that how happiness can be increased in by specific activities which are existing in particular cultures. So, their parameters include looking closely at the type of activities and their doses, the effort and agency of participants toward the activity and the fit between person and activity. So, having all such kind of understandings, it is important for us to know which activities are important in the given culture and how these could be connected with happiness. This criteria can be attained by devising interventions and activities that have cultural relevance for the group that one is studying. So, knowing cultural factors is very important for us for understanding happiness in this given culture as well as in this particular culture what kind of intervention programs or activities we could introduce to increase their happiness. In this series next uh, topic here is factors affecting happiness and well being. There are various factors. Let us take for first environmental factors. You know our behavior is interaction between our traits or our stable patterns and environmental factors. So, behavior is person and environment interactions. So, our characteristics or our traits or our stable patterns to behave in particular environment as well as environmental conditions. So, when we are saying environmental conditions, it means socio-cultural factors are very important for our happiness or for our particular behavior. That is why psychologists focus on positive institution country like trust and safety we have or corruption. This factor will be discussed a little bit more in next classes because uh, you know uh, that is why we are talking about positive schooling, positive institution, positive nations, positive communities because we are trying to provide particular uh, type of environment and this particular type of environment is facilitating our well being. On the other hand, we would like to delete or would like to reduce all those factors which may hamper our well being in school setting, in college setting, in institutions, in communities and we try to identify all those factors and just help to reduce intensity of those factors so that we can maintain our happiness level. So, individual's well being is surrounded by or affected by environmental factors. And when we say environmental factors and identify particular factors, then we may divide some unique or strong impact factors in two categories, whether this impact is in positive sense or this impact is in negative sense. When we say in negative sense, then we count it risk factors. On the other hand, if we say facilitating our well being, then protective factors. Some factors have been identified as risk factors like unemployment, poverty, poor education, inequality, poor living conditions. So, these factors are risk factors and these factors actually hamper our well being. On the other hand, other factors which can protect our well being are control, resilience and community assets, participation and uh, social inclusion. You feel you are part of your community or society. So, these factors are actually facilitating our well being. It has been observed that higher income, better health of mind and body and a high degree of trust in one's community, these contribute to high level of life satisfaction or happiness. On the other hand, poverty, ill health and deep divisions in the community, such kind of factors contribute to low life satisfaction. WHO has identified some factors as risk factors as well as protective factors for mental health. And uh, in this uh, association, they highlighted on individual attributes also. Individual attributes means our characteristics which are facilitating or hampering our mental health. 
So, in this case they observed that risk factors are low self esteem, emotional immaturity, difficulty in communications, medical illness, substance abuse etcetera. So, these are the factors which are risk factor for our mental health. On the other hand for protection there are some positive personality traits like self esteem, confidence, ability to manage stress and adversity, communication skills, physical health, fitness etcetera. If you could recall with the starting point of uh, happiness uh, studies, we divided all theories in three groups and one of them was personality oriented theories. So, it denote to personality oriented theories in which we are saying, uh, saying that happiness is a stable pattern or happiness is a trait and it is correlated with some of the factors positively, but with others negatively. So, then we identify happiness versus rest of your traits in your personality and how these traits are contributing to your happiness or mental health or how these factors are disturbing your happiness or well being. Second factors are social circumstances, social circumstances as risk factors as well as protective factors. So, let us know what are the risk factors. Risk factors are loneliness, grief, neglect, family conflict, exposure to violence or abuse, low income and poverty, difficulties of failure at school, work stress, unemployment. So, if you are struggling in your social circumstances, then you have risk factors. On the other hand, protective factors are social support of family and friends good parenting, family interaction, physical security and safety, economic security, scholastic achievements, satisfaction and success at work. So, I think uh, you can easily understand that it is the low level on certain parameters. On the other hand, protective factors when you have high level on positive factors. Environmental factors, poor access to basic services, injustice and discrimination, social justice, exposure to war or disaster. On the other hand, protective factors as environmental factors, equality of access to uh, basic services, tolerance, integration, physical security and safety etcetera. So, these are different factors. I think you must have heard about world happiness reports. There are various reports 2012 onwards every year we have one report and we are showing that how different nations have different level of happiness and they are able to create list of or ranking of different countries on happiness. First of all, which important factors they consider in their report to test someone's happiness. So, what are those factors? In these reports mainly these factors are they uh, count GDP per capita, healthy years of life expectancy they count in this report when they assess uh, happiness level. Next factor is social support and it is measured by having someone to count on in time of trouble. So, if you count someone in time of trouble, then you have social support and that is uh, uh, you know positive indication. Next factor is trust or how do you perceive corruption in your country. So, as measured by a perceived absence of corruption in government and business. So, if you perceive there is no corruption then trust and if you perceive corruption is there that is a negative factor contribute to your happiness. Perceived freedom to make life decisions. So, do you have freedom? I think you can easily connect it with autonomy. So, perceived freedom to make life decision. Do you perceive autonomy? Do you perceive you have uh, freedom to have different decisions in your life? Another factor is generosity. It is measured by recent donations. Have you uh, recently donated? So, that is the question and you respond in terms of this question. Next is they have used life ladder or country ladder which I have been talking again and again and positive effect and negative effect questions. And they observe that social support, income, healthy life expectancies, these are top most factors. And in these cases, I think you can easily understand to some extent environmental factors are very important to address like uh, corruption, to address autonomy and various other factors. So, that is why they count happiness nation wise. 
in this report, I think uh, you must be knowing about some reports, Denmark is the happiest country and it is in the top list in almost all uh, the reports. So, what, what policies actually they have, what kind of environmental factors they have that is our interest and that is why I have uh, selected some of these countries to show how this happiness list is showing what is level of different countries on happiness. And India's result are not good. And uh, here worst thing is every year this level is deteriorating as it is reflected here its number is 118 and our score was 4.40 out of 10 and in 2007 it is more deteriorated and our number was 122 and score was 4.03. On the other hand, in 2018, this rank was 133 and score was 4.19. And in the latest research or latest report, it's our number is 420 and our score is 4.015. So, it means there are some factors. Even uh, recently, I came to know a study in which they are saying that India has topmost depression level or its highest depression in India. So, I think we should know what are the reasons why we Indians are showing low level of happiness as well as high score on depression, anxiety, etc. I think uh, we should take into account some uh, factors which are important or hampering our well-being. This is the way to show uh, country wise data and when I am talking about country wise data and uh, nation wise uh, results and all, then our objective is to know what are the environmental factors which are facilitating our well-being. So, I think with this study which is from you know Denmark's data and how environmental factors are contributing to their well-being. So, through this we can understand and compare with Indian settings how these people have higher level of and what are the facilities they get from the nation, from the uh, you know policy decisions which are facilitating their well-being. They observed that in the last 30 years research, De Denmark people tend to be the happiest one and they are saying that they pay high tax rates people pay tax between 50 to 70 percent and that is why to some extent they can maintain level of uh, economy and uh, equally distributed to some extent. This state is called welfare state and social equality and security they have. They actually here it uh, provides universal tax funded and uh, they provide people child care, parental leave, health care, education including universities, retirement pensions and sick leave. And uh, it has been observed that if someone lost their job, then 90 percent of uh, the salary they usually get for 4 years. So, get paid to go to college between 400 to 500 dollars. It means to some extent they are in safe and secure environment and they do not have insecurity. These people are environmentally conscious and one third rides cycle. So, I think these all facilitators help them to have higher level of happiness. It is also reported that democratic uh, countries generally report higher level of happiness. So, I think it is very important to understand for us is there are some environmental factors and these environmental factors are highly connected with happiness. So, the countries which are facilitating such kind of factors, they have higher level of well-being as compared to other countries and that is why uh, environmental factors are very important for us. Let us understand happiness in terms of demographic variables, in terms of income, relationship, age, gender, religious activities and TV, uh, internet, etc. Let us take one by one. What do you think about income? Do you think money is positively correlated with happiness? Let us see what psychologists speak about it. Does money make us happy? Some people could say yes, others could say no. If we just uh, take overall data, then individual who live in countries with high GDP on average score higher on well-being measures than those living in countries with low GDP. So, I think overall view we can say the people who are living in the countries where uh, they have a high GDP, they have higher level of well-being as compared to the people who are living in the countries where they have low level of GDP. So, to some extent role of uh, money is uh, 
reflecting in such kind of studies. On the other hand, other studies say that moderate increase in individual income could lead to more happiness, but when it reaches at a certain high income level, those positive relationships would disappear. So, it means up to particular level it has its role, but after that that is disappeared. Other psychologists pointed out that there was no significant relationship between income and happiness. Hence, they support the convention wisdom of money can't buy happiness. I think if we just take into account different researches, if we are struggling on our uh, uh, primary needs to fulfill, then money matters. But if all those needs are fulfilled, then there is no role of money. So, up to certain level, when we are struggling to fulfill our needs, then money matters and money is very important factor for us. But once we have, we cross that limit, uh, then extra money we are getting, then it has not any important role. So, that is why in some studies it showed significant connection with happiness, but not in all studies. Next factor is relationship. Spending time in social settings enhances level of well-being among both introverts and extroverts it has been studied. And if you could revisit the theories of happiness almost in all theories they focused on positive relationships. And in previous studies also they focused on how if we are using more social words we are happier and uh, relationship are very important for us. In terms of marriage and uh, children, it has been observed that married people are happier than unmarried people and they stay uh, together more compared to other people. So, the relationship between children and marital uh, satisfaction shows high level of life satisfaction at marriage and then drop at the birth of the first child. They are saying that after birth of first child, this happiness usually drop. And uh, in terms of uh, children, some more studies, the level of life satisfaction also continue to drop throughout childhood and adolescence, then returns to high levels when the children leave uh, the home. Therefore, having children may decrease level of subjective well-being for some individuals. However, these studies are from Europe, from western countries. I think if we just uh, consider cultural factors, we may get different results here. And we are not sure whether we will be getting such kind of results in which they are saying that happiness level decrease if when you have children in your home. So, uh, similarly there are some other studies in which they are saying among those who have children, the age of their children also matters. And they are saying that children under 3 and teenagers a lower level of parental happiness. On the other hand, 3 to 12 years are associated with higher level of parental happiness. So, broadly they are saying that up to 3 and then when your children are teenagers, then you have lower level of happiness. On the other hand, 3 to 12 years I think uh, of your children you enjoy more as per these studies. Similarly, they are saying that uh, engaging in intimate talks that is friendship experiences for women and they listed it 90 percent. 90 percent of women listed having uh, uh, friendship experiences and intimate talks and these are actually important for them for happiness. And for men it was the second most frequently reported friendship experiences and it was uh, listed by about 80 percent men. So, that is why you know friendship experiences, intimate talks are very important for us for happiness. In a study on 13 to 24 years old Americans on what makes you happy, the most frequently reported answers was spending time with family followed by spending time with friends. Almost 75 percent stated that spending time with their parents made them happy. So, that is why adolescence and early adulthood period participants also give importance to interpersonal relationship in terms of their family as well as friends. Age, again contradictory results we have. Some studies are saying that young people are happier, others are saying that old middle group and all. So, let us know how the studies are connecting age with happiness. Diener et al. 1993 pointed out that age was not significant in determining happiness because individuals adjust their aims and goals as they grew older. So, as per their age, 
uh, they plan their aims as well as way of living their goals and that's why it's not very significant variable on the other hand other scholars claimed that the relationship between age and happiness was u shaped u shaped means individuals tended to feel happier in their young adulthood the years 18 to 34 years and during old age 60 and above as compared to when they were in their mid age 35 to 64 years so that's why it's in u shape similarly many studies have found that older persons tend to be more satisfied with life than their young counterparts and uh, the various researches in this uh, direction have been conducted but most of them are contradict to each other because there are various mediating variables and without counting those variables we may get contradiction in results and some studies saying that particular group is happier as compared to another group in contrast to the u-shaped relationships some scholars found that age and happiness has a negative relationship implying that older individuals were more likely to be unhappy compared to their uh, younger counterparts. So, that is why various studies showing different results because there are various factors which are mediating and we do not take into account those factors. Uh, in Indian study, we observed that we had uh, various mental health indicators like subjective well-being, personal well-being, mental health, quality of life. Almost in all research papers, we documented that early adolescents, that is 13 to 15 years was happier as compared to late 16 to 18 years. And we also reported that they have higher level of depression, anxiety, stress. What is your response in terms of gender? what do you think who are happier males or females let us know how psychologists explore this particular factor in terms of happiness before 1985 women were happier than men around 1989 their happiness level were equal to men but now they reported lower levels of happiness than men and uh, there are various other studies like a additional data taken from around the world indicated similar trends in 125 countries out of 147 countries. So, in this case they are saying that now uh, the latest data showed us females are lesser happy as compared to their male partners. It has also reported that life satisfaction scores have decreased in recent years for both men and women. However, the declining well-being rating for women were dramatically low and significant. This declination is more dramatic and significant in uh, females. Further, depression rates were found to be higher among Asian Americans, especially among young women than among uh, Euro Americans. So, all these further studies are taking into account gender as well as cultures. So, let us see how uh, different cultures as well as gender showing different results. A Gallup poll found that 39 percent of African Americans were very satisfied with their personal lives in contrast to 58 percent of whites. Similarly, 44 percent of African Americans said they are very happy compared to 52 percent of whites. However, African American men aged 70 or older reported being happier than older white men did and African American children reported higher self esteem than white children. So, it means age, gender and cultural factors all are very important to understand happiness. When we say religious activities, religious people have reported uh, having slightly higher level of subjective well being than those who do not and there could be various factors in between like belief in something higher, spirituality, perception of life events. I have observed that religious people use some healthy defense mechanisms and that is why to some extent they could have lower level of well-being. Let us also know a little bit how TV and internet is connected with happiness. Many studies have shown that watching TV is associated with lower happiness. 
it has been associated with a relative decline in social life and increased aggression. So, if you are watching aggressive programs, then there may be aggressive behavior in your personality and social life is also hampered when you spend more time with TV. Similarly, with internet, what you are doing using internet or misusing internet. So, sometime if we are spending more screen time, then it is hampering our well being. So, that is why in recent literature various new phenomena have been observed where they are giving even training to use internet like uh, sometimes are there like digital mindfulness, digital nutrition. Digital nutrition means it explores a range of social emotional and cognitive impacts of our technology use and overuse and provides solution to help maximize the benefits of device and avoid the pitfalls. So, learn to use internet in positive direction rather in negative direction or negative impact on our well being. In this series, our next topic is lessons from research, barriers to well being. What are the factors which are hampering our well being, which are obstacles in the path of getting well being? So, there are various factors which have been highlighted in different researches. Let us discuss all those barriers, what these are and how these are actually hampering our well being. First barrier is negativity bias refers. Our tendency is to pay more attention and give more uh, weight to negative rather than positive emotions, experiences and information. Hence, we are more likely to remember an insult, a criticism or a piece of negative information or feedback than compliments or a piece of positive information or feedback. Studies showing that mean ratio of positive to negative emotion was at or above 2.9, then people tended to flourish in life. So, it means if we have 3 to 1 positive versus negative emotions, then only we would be flourishing in our life. This means for every negative emotion, there must be 3 positive emotions. So, Research has shown that negative emotions reduce our level of well being more than positive emotions increase it. So, that is why uh, if we talk about ratio of positive and negative emotions for flourishing in our life, we should have 3 times more positive emotions as compared to negative emotions. Second barrier is duration neglect. When we evaluate our positive and negative experiences, their duration hardly matters. This is what psychologists call the duration neglect. It means particular experiences, whichever length you have that does not matter when we count it for our happiness, say whether it is a 2 weeks or 2 months or 6 months. Factor which are more important include here the intensity of the peak positive or negative emotions. So, what was the intensity of that experience? How much peak level it had in positive or as well as in negative emotion and second was how the experience ends. For example, length of this uh, event was uh, with heavy loaded with negative emotion, but at the end we had happy ending. On the other hand, some positive emotions we had, but end was with the negative emotions. So, this experience ends matters to us in which direction we would have that experience as well as connection of this experience with our happiness. Third barrier is social comparison. We make comparison with our friends and neighbors to determine how well we are doing in our life and that is famous uh, paradox, Eastern Lynn paradox. And as per this uh, uh, message, between 1946 and 1970, the US witnessed remarkable economic expansion and yet surveys failed to show any increase in happiness throughout this period of post-war boom. And they observed that actually when we observe our status or when we perceive our status, we compare ourselves with the surrounded people. For example, when you get an increment and this increment is for you only in your group, then you would be more happy as compared to if all group members have received equal level of increment. So, in equal level of increment as per comparison, you all of you uh, received that uh, 
level and that is why you have not any change. On the other hand, if you are alone to get that increment, then as per social comparison or group comparison, you feel higher as compared to others. Fourth barrier is the hedonic treadmill. Uh, recall some of the happy events of uh, your past promoted and got a pay rise or a brand new uh, company car you purchased. So, remember how excited and happy it made you feel. Now, think how long they stayed excited and happy, a few days, a few weeks. In all likelihood, it was not very long. So, after that you get your baseline once again. So, these changes in your behavior or some new exciting events of your life, these exciting events change your happiness for a short period. But in long run, you have baseline level of happiness. So, that is your stable pattern of behavior and again you get your baseline which is your natural level of happiness. So, uh, that is why shopping and material goods do not raise your well-being levels permanently and these are temporary changes whether these are in terms of ups or in terms of low. But most of the time after certain period, after short period I should say uh, we have baseline level of happiness. Fifth barrier is lack of self-control. Self-control often called self-regulation refers to our ability to control our impulse and channel our effort in a way that uh, will allow us to reach particular goals. So, if we have higher level of self-control, then we are achieving more things in our life, more achievements in our life we have, which are highly correlated with well-being. So, psychology studies show that higher self-control is actually linked to higher well-being, because then you have higher level of achievements, better purpose in life, meaningfully you are serving your life and all those things are connected with well-being. Self-control is a bit like a muscle, the more you practice it, the stronger it gets. So, developing self-control in one's life domain can help to strengthen your self-control in other areas. So, self-control is very important and once we start to practice, we expand its uh, areas and in different domain of our life, we use self-control and get better level of well-being. Let us discuss about some happiness affecting factors also. First, which is very important is relationship. Here, this relationship has been addressed in a different way. Psychologists suggest that the positivity ratio in your relationship needs to be at least 5 to 1. This means that there must be 5 times more positive emotions going on in the relationship than negative emotions. So, it means in your life 5 positive relationship to 1 negative relationship is required for flourishing in your life. Diener and Seligman in 2002 studied the happiest 10 percent of college students. Such students enjoyed highly fulfilling social life. So, social life is very important for us and in terms of ratio, uh, 5 times more positive interpersonal relationship we should have compared to negative emotions. Second very important factor here is how do you use your time? Do you use it in constructive way or you are spending your time in unconstructive way? Studies showing that when you are doing creative activities, uh, participating in youth programs or religious communities or some other uh, important programs for you, then due to constructive use of your time, you are happier. Creative activities, studies saying that young person spends 3 or more hours per week in lessons or practice in music, theater or other arts. So, if you are spending your time in creating activities, then you are happier. Youth programs, some students may spend some time say 3 or more hours per week in sports, clubs or organizations at school or at community organizations. So, during this period again you experience a higher level of well-being religious community, young person spends one hour or more per week in activities in a religious institution, they are happier. So, as per these studies, when you are spending three or more hours per week uh, for creative activities, three or more hours per week uh, for youth programs as well as you know some time for religious activities, then you are happier.
Here I think this is very important point to share with you. There are some intervention programs in which we just ask them to spend time accordingly. These activities are like entertainment of the day, at least one activity you enjoy per day. So, such kind of activities focused processes may help us to have higher level of well-being. Physical exercise very important for us as Professor Sher has mentioned, not exercising is like taking depressants. Apart from helping creative new brain cells, you must be knowing that when we do physical exercise, we create new brain cells. Physical exercises also help us in positive direction. For example, enhances body image, self esteem and self perception, improves sleep patterns, reduces emotional distress and increasing well being, reduces depression, reduces stress and improves general health. So, physical exercises help us to reduce depression, anxiety, stress etcetera and promote our general health, self esteem, self perception, uh, create new brain cells and that is why having physical exercise is very important for us to have higher level of well being. Some scholars are talking about optimal well being and for maintaining this optimal well being, we have to have our best, our connection with our true selves. As Abraham Maslow mentioned that, if you deliberately plan on being less than you are capable of being, then I warn you that you will be unhappy for the rest of your life. It means if you are not growing positively, not at your fullest potentiality, not self actualized, not growing as per your requirements or as per your potentiality, then you would not be happy in your life. Various researchers working from positive psychology perspective have investigated topics such as how to nurture your best self and how to foster your true self. So, that is why having true self, having you know best selves, these are very important to maintain our well being and enhance our well being. Next concept is intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. I think it is good opportunity to learn this concept in detail because I also discussed in previous slides as well as this concept will be revisited again and again. Intrinsic motivation is when we are compelled to engage in some activities for its own sake regardless of any external reward. So, during this period because we want to do that work, we love to do that work we have our internal interest to do those activities and that is why we are participating in particular type of work. On the other hand, extrinsic motivation is when we act to obtain some external reward. For example, status, praise, money or another incentive that comes from outside ourselves. For example, a student studying for uh, getting good marks or attending classes for attendance, person doing job for money as well as for promotion. So, in all these cases your reasons or your causes of motivations are external. So, that is difference between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Rian and Desi in 2008 they gave two parallel terms autonomous motivation or intrinsic motivation. It means self chosen and is congruent with one's true self. So, I want to do and that is why I am doing. On the other hand controlled motivation or extrinsic motivation, external rewards or guilt and is not congruent with a person's core values. So, in this case actually we are giving key of our happiness in others hand. If you reward my activities then I am happy. If you are not rewarding my activities, then I am not that much happy. So, it means in this process, I am giving key of my happiness in others hand. Another phenomena to understand happiness is based on the goals and uh, these goals may be divided into approach versus avoidance goals. Approach goals motivate us to move towards something. For example, I want to get a PhD in psychology. On the other hand, avoidance goals motivate us to avoid difficulties, dangers and fear. For example, I try to avoid speaking in public because it makes me nervous. 
and studies have found that approach goals are more likely to be associated with subjective well-being than our avoidance goals. So, we should have more approach goals in our life rather avoidance goals to get higher level of well-being. Another important factor is to know what is correlation between personality and happiness. It has been observed that there are stable personality patterns and these stable personality patterns are correlated with happiness. If you could recall the third division of theories which we had at initial stage in which I said happiness and its related uh, traits. So, in this relation we are saying that there is composition of various traits, some of these are positively correlated with happiness, but others are negatively correlated with happiness. In this series, if we talk about personality specific traits and happiness, then it has been observed that emotionally stable extroverts are happiest people. Extroversion has been shown to predict level of happiness up to 30 years in the future. Extroversion is positively correlated with happiness because of its certain facets and uh, it is uh, positively correlated with happiness. Higher happiness may be as a result of extroversion cheerful facet. They have a general tendency to experience more positive emotions, to laugh more than others, to joke more uh, frequently and to experience more positive emotions. So, there are some sub factors of extroversion which are highly correlated with happiness and that is why totality of this uh, facet or this super factor extroversion is correlated with happiness. On the other hand, when we say neuroticism and emotional stability, I think there is no argument when we are saying that emotional stable people are happier as compared to the people who have high score on neuroticism. There are some other factors also like hardiness which is with 3 C's commitment, challenge and control. And this type of personality has been counted as stress proof personality and definitely such kind of people or the people who have these traits or these characteristics, they are happier than the other people. Power of positive thinking is also important. However, a need to understand with whom this power is. If we just take simple difference between optimism and pessimism or optimist people and pessimist people, then broadly we can say optimist people are happier compared to pessimist people. But it has been observed that sometime uh, positive styles are not useful if they have some low level of self esteem or having some neuroticism level in their personality. There are two examples here, those who possessed low self esteem actually felt worse after repeating affirmations, I am a lovable person or when asked to think about how an affirmation was true for them. So, in this case normal person would have changes in positive direction because of low self esteem they had not similar kind of results. Similarly, those who scored high on neuroticism did not feel less negative emotion when asked to repress a past negative event. So, that is why if a person is with negative aspects or negative emotions, then maybe the power of positive thinking does not work in that direction. So, that is why we should understand in depth in which direction they have their emotions in positive direction or in negative direction and as per this direction what kind of strategies could be useful for them. One another very important phenomena here is top down and bottom up theories. In top down and bottom up theories we found different ways to define happiness and different factors which are contributing to happiness. Let us know both of them. In general, there are two ways to approach the question of how to calculate our well-being. Number one, that is bottom-up theory and overall assessment of our current well-being by examining how satisfied we are with the various domain of our life and total score of all the domains. So, in this case, we are actually studying level of your satisfaction or happiness in different domains of your life say satisfaction in your family life, satisfaction in your professional life, satisfaction in your personal life, satisfaction in your academic life, satisfaction 
in your other lives and a summary statement of overall well-being. So that is one way of. So if you are satisfied or happy in your different domains of life, then you should be happy overall and that is the way of assessing someone's happiness level. On the other hand, another level is top-down approach. In top-down model, our subjective well-being evaluations reflect how we evaluate and interpret our experiences. Our stable patterns to evaluate the situations or events of our life. You must have observed that there are some, I think we have been talking about all these factors. There are some factors and as per these factors, we have tendency, different tendency to define different events differently. And these patterns are contributed by personality traits, attitudes and cognitions. So all of us have different ways of defining same situation because of our different internal processes. And I think it is not difficult to understand when I am saying this is very important. You must have observed that one particular event defined differently by different people. One particular situation addressed or perceived differently by different people. When I am saying differently perceived by different people, then it means they had unique type of personality traits, unique attitudes and unique cognitions they had and that is why they defined particular situation in uh, different ways. So that is what goes on inside a person. So what is happening within us or within our own world that is reflecting in our ideas or in our responses. So it means personality traits, attitudes, cognitions and various other factors are helping us to have particular patterns to define certain situations and that is called top down model. If a bottom up perspective is correct then in interventions or when we are understanding human behavior on happiness or on other constructs then we will focus more on the situations for example a better job, safer neighborhood and higher after tax income to count a few options others. So then we should try to change your surrounded factors to make you happy. On the other hand if we take into account top down model is correct then interventions to increase happiness should focus on changing people's attitudes, beliefs, perception or personality traits. So then we try to change your way of perceiving this world that is more important. I think that is very important phenomena that is why we should understand it a little bit more. When we are saying bottom up perspective then there are uh, various domains of our life and all those domains should be satisfied to have higher level of well being. On the other hand when we are saying top down model then we have certain patterns to define or evaluate or perceive certain situations. And during this process our attitudes, beliefs, perception, personality traits mediate in between and that is why we have individual differences. And then that is why we should focus more on those processes which help us to have positive perception. So in this case for example then one must learn optimism, one must learn to perceive positively things. So I think these two models are clear now. So the top down theory is supported by studies that find certain attitudes, self perception and personality traits and are highly correlated with subjective well being. Some studies saying that role of these models for example earlier studies favored the top down uh, process and reported that some researchers estimated that 52 percent of well being was due to top, top down processes and only 23 was due to bottom up factors. So they are saying that this uh, you know estimate is different or role of these two models are different in terms of factors of happiness. More recently investigators argued that the bottom up predictors may be more important. So simultaneously other scholars saying that both of them are important but utilized in different situations and times in life is important and we should give due respect of both the models as per the requirement of our study. I will keep this topic continue in the next class. Thank you.